All right. So welcome. We are here today. We have our alumni career chat, the first of our spring semester with Tamara Keith. And she is an entrepreneur, a CEO of her own ice cream store. And we will be introducing her shortly. I also have Ivy Rivas, one of our own current Drucker MBA students, who is the president or co-president of our Drucker Entrepreneurship Association. And Ivy is going to be um, conducting our discussion today, facilitating. And so just a little housekeeping, if you can turn on your, your uh, cameras and go ahead and mute yourself. Feel free to ask questions. You can put them in the chat or raise your hand, unmute yourself. Um, we'd love to hear you introduce yourself and what program you're studying or what you've studied in the past as you ask your questions for Tamara today. And on that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ivy. So thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. And thank you especially to Tamara for you know joining us. Take a moment to formally introduce Tamara. Um, Tamara Keith is a Drucker MBA 2008 alum. She is the CEO and flavor temptress at Clementine's Naughty and Nice Ice Cream. Tamara has an appreciation for ice cream and what it represents, community and moments of connection. Her life's journey from a girl born into an economically disadvantaged family growing up on food stamps to a self-made ice cream entrepreneur is nothing short of extraordinary. Keith had over 25 years of experience working across global brands in the consumer packaged goods industry before deciding to invest her life savings into opening up an ice cream shop in the St. Louis neighborhood. Clementine's fantastical ice cream flavors and exceptional quality as a micro creamery have impressed shop visitors since 2015. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so unfortunately, Tamara could not be here in person. However, we're very grateful and she did mention you can order her ice cream online. So if anyone's interested in checking that out, that is you know, an amazing opportunity. Um, we do have a list of questions already um, you know, set and ready to go. But if any students have any questions that they would like to ask themselves, as Deborah mentioned, please send them in the chat or either raise your hand. Um, and then before we start with the questions, Tamara, did you have anything you might want to say or just a little blurb about yourself, maybe something that I've missed? Um, actually, my name is Tamara. I'm so sorry, Tamara, Tamara. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right, that's all right. Nope. I think other than that, you're you're great. All right. Thank you for correcting. I'm so sorry. Um, all right. So we'll get started with the first question. Um, if you could please share your CGU journey and postgraduate career path with us. Sure, sure. So um I uh started uh Claremont graduate at the Drucker School. Um Oh gosh, I don't even remember when, but um, I, I started out doing the four plus one program at Pitzer. I don't know if that program still exists, um, but I worked through that program, um, went in, uh, got my MBA, um, really was impressed. I had seen Doris Drucker uh, speak a couple of times. Unfortunately, I never got to see Peter, but I saw Doris. Um, and I was super involved with the Claremont ecosphere, having gone to Pitzer. Um, and so I was very excited to be part of the Drucker community. I think having uh, been a non-traditional student when I got my undergraduate degree and then going into the MBA program, um, it gave me a unique perspective um, and also uh, probably made it so much easier to love campus and, and what I was doing in the journey. Um, I got to work under some amazing professors, Dr. Jean Lippman Blumen, who was amazing. Um, I, I just had such a great experience there. Um, that's that, That's been like really amazing for me. And I think part of, part of my journey was uh, coming out of business school at the time I had more, I had eight job offers 
for me before I got out of uh, the Drucker School um, because I really put together a solid marketing plan when I went into the program. I was really um, uh, convinced that I wanted to go into a rotational program after graduating. I, I knew that I only wanted to work for uh, a company that Peter Drucker had consulted with. So I put together a really solid business plan of like, okay, I want a rotation program. They had to have been a Peter Drucker client. Um, you know, I really just put together good strategy and marketing plan. And so then when I hit the streets and I started applying, like I did it from like my first month or two coming into the program. I was like, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to work for right? They're going to have the same values that we had at the Drucker School. And since I was non-traditional and coming in when I was a lot older, the program resonated with me because when I looked at other MBA programs, they were focused on lots of different areas, but they really forgot the, the human leadership component. And that was just standard in the MBA program there. And I, I was, that was really something that was important to me because I was an org studies major at Pitzer. And so I knew I wanted business, but I, with kind of that HR, that human component. And I think Drucker was really, really special in that it had that program, that leadership and self-development was part, just part of the program. It wasn't an elective. It was, if you're going to be here and get an MBA from us, this is what we're going to guide you and instill in you and teach you. So um, from that perspective, I think it was great. And because I did that, as I interviewed with all of these Drucker companies who believed in Peter's philosophies, um, I was able to leverage that in all my interviews and people were impressed and it was different and it was unique because I was able to leverage what I was learning at Drucker and why I chose them and Peter's philosophies um, on management. And it's not just about doing well, doing good. Like I pulled that and I developed my own like personal brand around the Drucker school and Peter Drucker's philosophies in my whole resume, in my whole interviewing uh, strategy. Um, and it was really successful. I think, I think at the time, I, I think I was in even some, like I had like 40 interviews my first year. Like it was, it was nuts and crazy. And, you know, I ended up with all these job offers coming out of school, but it's, you know, it's because I applied what I learned in my MBA program. That was a very long answer to your short question, but that's my answer nonetheless. No, that's amazing and very inspirational for us who are going through the same thing. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, the next question I have is if you could describe a typical day in your role and the key skill sets that you consistently leverage. Wow. You know, my day is never typical, right? Whether it's I'm working with the production team, the marketing teams, bankers, lawyers, my day is different every day which I actually really love. Um, it's uh, when they say that when you do what you love, you never work another day in your life. Um, and that's like amazing having started my own company. But I will say that I'm only successful now as an entrepreneur because I had 25 years in corporate America and I worked in every marketing role. I started at the bottom. I worked my way up. I took every assignment that no one ever wanted to do because I wanted the experience and I wanted to have a seat at the table when other people might not necessarily be there, even if it was doing like a menial task because executives if they get used to seeing you at the table and they can rely on you even for little things, they start relying on you for big things and you start getting lots of opportunities that other people don't. So, sorry, I digress a little bit. Um, so I don't really have a, a typical day per se. What was the second part of your question? Just so some skill sets that maybe you mm. use. Um, you know, it's all about the people. It's all about my team. I think when I started my company, it was maybe more about me. And as we continue to grow and I had to learn to become more successful and manage different workforce, workforces than I ever had in my corporate life, um, 
it's always it's always people first. It's always the team. How do I lead, motivate, inspire my team every day to do what they do? Because, you know, when you start your own company, you don't have all the money in the world like these big companies do to pay people, right? So you got to find people who believe in the vision and the dream and what you're doing. And, and you've got to like instill in them the vision and what they're a part of to get them bought in to what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again. Um, our next question is if you could provide insights into your organization organizational culture at your current workplace. Um, you know, culture is something that you build every day. It's not something that you do it once and you're like, oh, I built it, it's set. It's um it's knowing that the team knows that you're in the trenches with them, even if they don't see you every day. So there's, because I started my company by myself, right? I was the first person to make ice cream. The first person to make delivery is the first person to work in my first shop. You know, we have eight locations now and we're, we'll be at 15 or 16 locations within the next five years. Um, I think people know that there's no job in the company that I won't do or that I haven't done or that I can't do, right? If I still have a free afternoon and I'm I'm in my office, I'll change clothes, put on my hairnet and, and my kitchen shoes, and I will go out and wash buckets with our dishwasher, right? I'll go in and make ice cream and they're like, oh, she's, she's back, she's, you know. But I think that's important that people see that it doesn't matter how high you get in the organization or what you do, like we're all in it together. And I think that's super, super important because I think sometimes people get to a place where they think, oh, I don't have to do that stuff anymore. And I don't think that way at all. Like I will show up at a festival and I will scoop ice cream. I will show up in the kitchen and, and wash dishes, you know, an hour after an hour before I've got to go deal with the president of a bank and talk about major financing, right? Like it's, it's all, um, it's a part of how I built my cult culture. And I think- you know, we're a women run and women led organization as well. And so that provides its own unique identity, um, understanding and culture and how we approach each other anyway. So that also is very different. That's amazing. We always love to hear that. That's great. Um, my next question is if you could discuss the diverse opportunities that are available within your company. Well, everything is available. I think, you know, that's that's one of the things when you, after you work in corporate America, one of the great things about working in corporate America is you learn what you want and you learn what you don't want. And everyone should have to work for jerks. Really, everyone should have to work for a boss that they cannot stand, that they think is toxic, that they think is horrible, even for <clears throat> a short period of time, because it's only in those moments how you vow to yourself, how you're never going to be, how you're never going to treat people, how if you have your own company someday, I'm going to do it different. I'm not going to do right. And so if, if people just kind of coast and always have this great experience, I don't think that they get challenged and they definitely don't get to learn. A lot. And so um I think I think those are are important things. And when I I guess when I think about providing diverse opportunities, you know, you have to let people find what they're good at and really fo you know, one of director's tenants is fo find your strengths and focus on your strengths. Don't don't focus on your weaknesses and as you build your team, find the people that have strengths that want to work and have passion about something and then let them go do that. I think people sometimes get stuck in organizations. They're like, oh, but they're just such a great staff accountant. Well, maybe that staff accountant wants to go work in our bakery and make brownies every day, right? They realize they're never going to make the money that an accountant does. But if they're happy, don't be afraid to say, yeah, go work in the bakery. Try it out for six months, right? Um, and, I, and I think we've done a good job at <clears throat> letting people try on different roles in our organization, giving them a path back if they if they don't want it at some point. Um, but, you know, we, we've had people go from 
front of the house working in our scoop shops to back of the house, right? Um, we are definitely uh, an LGBTQ friendly organization as well. And um, we are a safe, we, uh, what they call a safe workplace for folks in transition as well. So we always have four to five folks who are in transition uh, work for us in different parts of the company because we understand what that transition journey looks like. Um, and we're very um, supportive and understanding of what needs to happen at their life at different points as they're going through that. Um, and so I think we've made it a point to make sure that we're we have an environment where people feel safe and comfortable because at the end of the day, everyone deserves to uh, make money and be productive and feel like they're giving back to society. Um, and that's always been really important to me. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, my next question is, how would you guide students on effective methods to search, discover, and apply for opportunities in a similar field? So if we wanted to, you know, follow in your footsteps slightly, maybe how would you guide a student to do that? Well, depending on, on what you want to do, go get some good experience doing a lot of different jobs that surround whatever that is, right? If, if you want to open up a commercial bakery, go bake bread for somebody for two years, right? Like, go see what it takes to get the job done. Go see what it takes to deliver it. Go see what it takes to get customers for it. Go see what it takes to what the grocery channel requires of, of companies, of bakeries, right? And what that means to consumers. Go take, you know, work in marketing and figure out how to market to the people who love bread, right? I'm just using that as an example. Um, but like, go, go get the experience that you need and, and, and don't feel so, I want to say entitled, you know, I remember going to school with folks who were like, oh, I have my MBA and I have a finance specialty and I want to go be an investment banker on wall street. And I want no other job, but that, right. And a lot of them either didn't get jobs or they got into those jobs and they didn't love them and they felt like they were so tied and, and committed to it and that that's where they needed to be as opposed to, hey, go find a job where you're going to learn something, right? Get your foot in the door somewhere, right? Find a company that resonates with you that you really like. Yeah, so you may not make that $100,000 a year out the gate. That's okay. Go start with 50 and go learn because some jobs you're going to learn a lot more in that is going to take you so much further down the road and give you that competitive edge over somebody else that hasn't done that, right? I mean, I guess I would I would say like really think think about what you want to do and how you want to get there and sometimes the the doorway to get there isn't always the way that you think. You know, I have a I have a girlfriend who I graduated with um, and she she wanted to go to that investment route in New York. And at the time, there just weren't jobs to to, to get. And she took a job in an uh, investment banking firm as a receptionist with an MBA, a receptionist. Right. And everyone was like, girl, you're crazy. But guess what? She was there. Her foot was in the door. She talked to everyone. She got to know everyone. She took on different projects. And within two years, she was working in the job that she wanted to have when everyone else thought that she was a fool for taking that kind of job. And now she's incredibly, incredibly successful. And she knows how that company works because she started out as the receptionist. Thank you. Um, next, we wanted to ask, what do you see in your future for yourself and for your company? Well, Clementine's is on a high growth trajectory. Uh, we will be doing our first capital raise this year, um, and we are planning on expanding into the Midwest, and we're getting ready to go regional and then national. So California, here we come in a few years. Wow, that's very exciting. Thank you so much. Um, and then the last question that I have, but remember, if anyone else wants to ask a question, please throw it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but if you could just offer any additional valuable advice based on your professional experience. 
Hmm. Tra uh, travel, uh, see the world, hang out with and introduce and become friends with people who you would not normally, um, especially from, you know, different international communities, because we live in this vast world and, and different people from different places have different perspectives and they approach things different and you can learn so much from them. Even when I was at the, the Drucker school, I remember, you know, we kind of, you kind of get in your group of friends, right. That you normally hang out with. You normally sit in the same seats in the same class every time. Well, you know what? Move somebody's cheese. Go in and sit down in another seat of someone who normally sits somewhere else. And people are going to be like, ah, whatever. But you know what? You're going to meet other people. You're going to talk to other people. Um, and it was it, it it's it's really, really, really beneficial. Plus, you end up making lifelong friends and you get to travel all over the world to see them and their families and their companies um, and get some really good experience that way. Yeah, Michelle, please. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let me lower my hand because it's, there we go. Okay, Um. so as I listen to you, uh, Tamara, I'm just in awe because I think that um, a lot of what you have done and, and tackled in your life was obviously meant to happen, but at the same time, there's got to be some fear behind it, right? In in some ways where you're just kind of delving into these, all these different journeys. Um, you mentioned that you were a non-traditional student at Pitzer um, and then came through and then did the, the accelerated program, the 4-1 program. Um, and you may have mentioned a little bit of this, but what was that turning point in your life that took that leap? For you to, you know, just say, I'm going to, I'm going to change my trajectory the way that it was going. And now I'm going to start here and do this. I think it's when I decided to go back and get my degree. I, I didn't start my bachelor's uh, at Pitzer until I was 25. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I was definitely non-traditional. Um, and I think once I decided to get my education, my life took a different trajectory. It was about hustle and grit and sleepless nights. But the the beauty for, for me anyway was uh, the one thing in life no one ever can take away from you is your education, mm -hmm. right? You can gain money, win money, lose money, be rich, be like there's that your education is the only thing no one can ever take from you. And if you have a great education, which you're getting and which I got at the Drucker's at the Drucker school, um, it will be able to take you far. And have you it's seen with the faculty that you engaged with at um, the Drucker School of Management, have you stayed in contact with them? I have, I have um, through the years on and off. Uh, a, a few, a few, probably uh, Dr. Lippman Blumen uh, the most, uh, maybe not so much in the in the past few years because my head's been down in my in my company building the building the business. But definitely when I was uh, you know four, five, six years out of school, mm -hmm. I was definitely much more much more connected for sure. sure. Yeah, those are one of the things that we're constantly teaching our students is to keep those connections and to keep building that. Um, I just have one more question um, because it's, you know, all that's pending in my head and my craziness. Um, as you started with the first business and then you said you've expanded out, how did you know in that span of time or as a as an entrepreneur and as a businesswoman, how do you know when it's a time to expand and where to expand? Like, what do you do in your world to figure that out? A lot of data. Right. So we've looked at the locations that we have, what's worked, what hasn't worked, who's our consumer, who's buying our product, where are they coming from? Right. And then we found uh, similar areas, you know, similar neighborhoods. We're very much a neighborhood ice cream shop concept, even though we have eight and we'll soon have 14, 15 shops. Um, so we, we found the model that works and we've learned with every shop right? You refine it and okay, this, oh, this didn't work. Okay, we'll do this. Or, you know, you refine it every time and then you build your playbook and that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. And then my last question, and I promised my last one at the moment, um, are you planning on going on undercover boss at some point in order <laughs> to really see what's going on and 
what will your hairstyle be? Just the curiosity is going to get me. Um, I, I would absolutely love to go on that, but uh, the problem is so many people know me at still at all levels in my, in my company. And we're not quite that big yet where I have thousands of employees. Um, but yeah, I would, I would, I think that'd be, that'd be really fun. And I don't know what my hairstyle would be because it's, it's long and almost all gray now, but it's, uh, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. Like I'm like, Oh, oh. God, I love it. <laughs> um, okay. So that's, that's no great sister. <laughs> yeah. Just want to know the hairstyle and if you would be willing to do it. So, okay. I'll open it up to everyone else. I just had to throw out those couple questions. Sure. I have a question, Tamara. Um, what do you do to continually learn and grow and keep abreast of things? I mean, do you have certain books you read, podcasts, magazines, newspaper? What What are some of the ways that you continue to develop and grow for yourself? That's a great question. So um, I am actually uh, a member of two organizations. One is called EO, which stands for Entrepreneurs Organization. Uh, and the other one is YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And so I meet with a group of CEOs in each of those organizations once a month between six to eight CEOs. And we get together <clears throat> for four or five hours and we discuss our business challenges and we learn from each other. We update each other on what's happening in, in the world and different situations. And we we basic leverage and, and learn from each other. We have like this great advisory board. And so being part of those two organizations definitely helps me uh, stay ahead of the cur and, and curve and learn from other people who've already done it or who are done doing it in much bigger businesses than, than, my, than mine. Um, and we learn from each other. That's great. Um, and then turning it towards your employees, I know you mentioned that you allow employees to try out different roles, but you have a path back for them. What are some of the development or support resources you have for your employees and your company? Uh, what, what do you mean specifically about development or like train, training? Right, or... if you have training or workshops or career paths to advancement, um, just have, do you have Excuse set me. things or is it more organic? based on that individual employee? I think it's more based on the employee. Um, we're, we're not so big yet that we have all of those other systems in place. So it's really just, if someone wants the opportunity to try something out, we'll say, okay, great. Let's, let's make a plan for you to get there and to do it. And then you commit to that role for a certain period of time. And then let's plan for a way back if you don't want that or an opportunity to try something else on in, in the organization if that doesn't work. Okay. So, I, you know, we're, we're not quite too, you know, we're only a couple hundred employees. So I don't know that we have systems in place yet. It's really just about supporting each individual's growth and development. Mm -hmm. I had a quick question. Um, First of all, thank you so much. That was, I really enjoyed listening to that. Um, I'll introduce myself quickly. My name is Rachel. I'm in the full-time MBA program. Um, and I also work for a restaurant group and we've had an ice cream shop. So I have a lot of appreciation for everything that goes into making and selling ice cream. Um, but I was curious, you said that it's all about the people. And I think that is very true. And also sometimes the most challenging part um, so I want to know when you're building out a team, um, if there are certain characteristics that you're looking for that you see in people who will kind of latch on to that goal and that dream and work towards it with you, um, or if you feel like that's something that you can kind of train people um, and almost have them fall in love with the process. Yeah, I think, you know, if people have the will and they're bought into the vision, like they'll they'll get on board, right? They may not have the skill set, but we can we can train someone to do a job. What you can't train is to have the the alignment with our we call them cone values instead of core values, right? You can't you can't train that, right? You either have it or you don't. Um, and so 
as long as we have people who are bought in to our cone values and who are aligned and have skill set and hustle and grit and want and desire, then absolutely we can we can get get them there. Now, obviously, there are some technical roles, right? So an accountant, you know, you got to be a CPA, right? We need that, that, that I can't teach that because I don't even know what that is, right? Um, but, but other than that, I think you, if you find the will and that your, your co core value alignment, you can, you can make lots of things work. And, and, you know, the other thing too, that I've learned a lot in my business is, um, when you're starting out, the people who get you to hear are not going to necessarily be the people to get you to hear, which are also not necessarily the people to get you to hear. And that doesn't mean that they're not incredible, wonderful, loyal, dedicated people. It just means that when you are starting a business, you need people who are really good in a startup environment, right? Who are good with ambiguity, who can do a million different things, right? But as you get bigger and you start to scale and you put those systems in, in place because you need that structure, the people who are really awesome and kick-ass in that startup environment are not going to thrive and do well where they have structure and they're, they have to do it this way and they don't have the flexibility. And so I, I think that's also important is to realize, you know, and I know I struggled with that, right? Because I started with some incredible people who were just so awesome, but just couldn't handle it as we started growing and had more structure and more systems put in place. And like I said, it didn't mean that they weren't awesome people because they were, they just needed to find opportunities that let them be the best selves. And we at that point was weren't it, right? There's very few people who can mold and change so drastically to totally grow with you. And I think that's a very different mindset than, you know, most people traditionally, you know, think of like, oh, I'm gonna go work for this company and I'm gonna be there 20 years. Um, maybe in some really big companies where you can make different moves and find environments that are similar to what you can do, but in a high growing fast company, that's just not possible and that's okay. Right. Um, but you just have to be open to it and know it and, and be willing to say that it's not, it's also not personal, right? It's not because we're learning and growing, right? Like, you know, I have EO and YPO and executive coaches to help me get from here to here to here to here. And, you know, not everybody's like that. And and I think just kind of understanding where you are in your journey and how you like to work and what's really important, right? Like, it, so it, it's interesting. So having grown up in corporate America and having 25 years experience there before starting my own company, Right. I managed MBAs. I was around MBAs all the time, right? We're all A-type. We're all overachievers for the most part. Like we're all very similar. We're motivated by the same things. We're driven. Well, when I started my own company, my entire workforce was, they were not MBAs and are not MBAs, right? And so the first few years of my life, I was banging my head against the wall and like, these people don't get it. How come they're not motivated like I am? Like they could care less about like money or like they just had different motivators. And uh, <clears throat> I would fire people all the time. I'd make people cry because I was used to a, a corporate, like I was kind of a baller in corporate America. Like I was really successful and I had what worked and I had all these MBAs around me, like a certain type. And now all of a sudden I had a workforce I had no idea. I, I didn't understand them. I couldn't talk to them. I didn't know how to motivate them. I didn't know how to inspire them. Like, and it was just a different generation. It was just a different workforce. And I would get so frustrated until I, I, I think probably in year four, I woke up one morning and I realized they weren't the problem. I was the problem. And once I realized that I was the problem and that I needed to change and I needed to change how I thought I needed to change my approach. I, like it was me, my whole world shifted, my workforce shifted, my retention shift, like everything in my business shifted. And I became a kinder, softer, gentler, more understanding, 
you know, not that I still don't have thoughts in my head sometimes, but it definitely doesn't come out my mouth. Um, and understanding that different generations and, and different people are motivated and inspired by different things. Um, I changed a lot. I really changed a lot. Um, and I think that's super important. And I also think that's why we're so successful and a lot of other companies are, and a lot of the competition who's much bigger than me or, um, folks that have, you know, just come out of private equity and they go by and they blow up these other, you know, ice cream chain or whatever, and why they're not as successful is because they don't get that. They don't get that the workforce is different than maybe where, than where they came from. And until you really seek to understand and empathize with people and their life's journey and where they're at and what their motivations are, like, you're not going to be successful. And I think, thankfully, I, I learned that in probably year three, year four, you got to meet people where they're at and truly understand and not judge and accept and you figure it out. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's where it ended up. It did. That was very insightful. Thank you so much. That You're was welcome. beautiful. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, can I go with the other question? Okay. Um, my name is Nazia. I'm the graduating student. Like I'm about to graduate in May. So a lot of things that I took from your lecture, they are so inspiring because we are into like, you know, should we go into the workforce, join companies where like you talked about a term, you should work with jerks whom you don't like, but you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like that because sometimes you learn obviously, but then you don't have to be hard and fast. But I was thinking from another perspective, uh, what if you are going into a family business and then your relative is that sort of a person. So do you need to go to that business or do you need to go to the corporate sector? Because, you know, like it's a difficult situation. If you are given a choice and your relative is that sort, because business doesn't come with being nice. People just turn into who they are not, but that's the work that requires them to be like that. So like, I, I'm just trying to look at it from an organizational behavior perspective. You know, I, I I disagree. I think you can be nice. I think people know what they know and not everyone has the capacity or the awareness to think or to do something different. So, you know, family businesses are hard. They're hard because they're deep rooted in, in culture and hierarchy. Um, it's a hard place to be. It's probably an easy choice, right? Because there's a job there right? There's a job there. Um, but I think by going to work for someone else, even if it's a, a different family business, you you get to learn a lot and bring a skill set that that family business doesn't have, right? So going out there and getting some really good experience from somewhere else is only going to make it better if you, if, and when you do come back to a family business, because you'll be able to bring skill sets that you will not have had. Because also, if you've been raised around a family business or in a family business, you only know the way that they've done it, right? And I'm not saying that it hasn't been successful. It 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 might, but you you know what? Life is also really short, and so why go be unhappy, right? I'd rather go work for half as much and be really happy every day and learn and grow and be challenged and, and be happy, then, you know, then go where it's, it's comfortable and I could make a lot of money, but I'm really miserable. That's just my experience and my thoughts. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Kat. I am also in the full-time MBA program. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's been really, I've learned a lot. I was just curious if you could share, because you mentioned that you were in corporate America for 25 years, and I was wondering what made you kind of like, no, it's time to start my own business. And I'm also curious if it's okay, like why ice cream? I love ice cream, but... <laughs> 
So uh, my company is Clementine's Naughty and Nice Creamery. So you can find us on Instagram. You can check out the ice cream there and you can order it online. Um, but uh, so I think what made me decide, you know, I was exhausted. Like I climbed that corporate ladder. I was at the top. I was making so much money. I had, you know, so many direct reports. Like I had a global role, but, you know, I was traveling 262 days a year that I was gone. I was, I, I literally, I, I woke up one day, I said, oh my gosh, I'm 38 years old. I have no husband. I have no children. I never see my family. I never see my friends, but I have everything in the world that I thought that I wanted. And I was still the most miserable person I knew. And I was like, wow, I literally have everything I ever said I wanted, except for the things that actually really matter. And, and that was the motivation. You know, when I started Clementine's, I didn't set out to create an ice cream empire that I'm building now. I set out to open one little ice cream shop, right? I had this very romantic notion of leaving this crazy corporate life where I was always gone and everywhere around the world. Like I was just going to stay home, open a little ice cream shop, make ice cream, finally meet someone, get married, have a little girl, raise her in the ice cream shop, right? Like I had this very, very small vision of what I wanted because I just wanted to be happy. And I just wanted those things in life that I that I didn't realize that I wanted that I actually wanted. And so, um, but, you know, I build brands and I did marketing and strategy my whole career career. And so that's what I do. And so you do what you do best. And, you know, I turned Clementine's into this massive, really I, crazy, wonderful ice cream empire that we're growing and building. Um, and so I just kind of do what I do. Um, but I love it every day and I'm so, I'm so happy. And, you know, I, someday I'll make as much money as I used to make. I don't even care anymore because I get to do, I, I'm living my authentic life and I'm, I'm living an extraordinary life knowing that no matter what happens tomorrow, you know, God forbid I get hit by a bus or something happens. I have like no regrets in my life because I do good work every day. I've built a company where we employ hundreds of employees. Like I've done great things in my city it's just, it's, I have just so much meaning and purpose in, in my life. And, and that's, that's really what's important for me. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask? I know that we're nearing the end, but maybe we could take one more. I want to know uh, from all of you who are on the call, who are your favorite professors at the business school? I could start us off real quick. Um, so I'm getting my uh, concentration in finance. So um, I get along best with Jay Prague. He teaches like economics and finance here at Drucker. Yep, I had him as well. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I will actually second that. I'm also doing a finance certificate and I really, really enjoy um, Jay's classes and also um, Dr. Christine Kamara. Her classes are very wonderful. She's very insightful too. Oh, awesome. I, I never took her. Um, I don't want to copy, but they're also my favorites <laughs> um, uh, because I, I took like finance stuff in undergrad but I never really understood it but then Jay Prague would like discuss it in a way that I was like oh my god that makes so much sense that's what they were trying to tell me before um also Dr. Christine she was she's been really um she's teaching us of, about things that, are, that go beyond um what a business school is supposed to be like create your future so that's really interesting oh wonderful <laughs> So um, I, I, my favorite teacher is my uh, actually a new professor. His his name is uh, Professor Venkat Venkat Raman, and the reason why I really enjoy him is because he really just challenges me. I think a lot of subjects is not too challenging to me. Like I think it's just a lot of reading and a lot of analysis and like self reflection. But for him, it's really like I. 
<laughs> like, oh my gosh, I'm always like feel a little bit lost. And so I have to put in extra effort. So I really enjoy the challenges that he posts and he makes it in bite sizes and, and more interesting. Oh, very cool. I'll have to check him out. Yeah, it's operational stuff. So I think you'll enjoy it actually because it's it's about like planning and making sure you have you know enough production and supply and those kind of stuff. Oh, have you read the goal yet? No, I haven't. Oh, um, what is his name? He teaches supply chain operations there. He's Indian. He's so, so fantastic because he was a great practitioner as well as professor. Gosh, what is his name? VJ, is that who you're talking about? What's his last name? Is it safe or how do you? No, My not Jimmy. No, not VJ. He's, he's another one. Um, he taught supply chain operations management, but there was the goal. It's, it's a book. It's called The Goal. And it reads like a novel, but it's the best supply chain operations. I actually have people on my team. I have bought it and I've given it to them. And I had to read it in business school at, at there. And it was like, so it was like the best thing that made everything like click. And I was like, oh, it was such a great book. What is his name? I'm totally drawing a blank. Um, anyway, uh, read that book called The Goal. It ties in finance, operations, marketing, like, the weakest like uh, it, it's it's great it's and it's an easy read you can read it in like three or four hours but it's I think awesome his last name is gold rat the author of that book yeah 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 but i'm trying to remember the name of the the professor um from the drucker school who like taught us that Maybe and it wasn't vj no i've i've taken classes with vj before no it was an another oh in, was it bernie in, no no it was another indian guy but um I, i'm drawing a blank i should have looked up everybody's names before today but <laughs> I, I didn't but it was it, like one of the best classes i ever i ever took and it was in such an area that like had nothing to do with marketing business finance it was like greek to me and and it all like made everything come together so I have a quick question, Tamara. Um, did yeah. you take any classes from other faculty on campus? Or was it, did you just stay in the Drucker School of Management? I I mostly stayed in the Drucker School because, you know, leadership was really my focus and it was so strong. Um, <laughs> I did venture out a little bit, but I really stayed, stayed in the Drucker School. Cool. A lot. Yeah. Nazia, do you have any favorite professors? Um, yes, actually, I'm a non drucker but as Lily said, I took Professor Winkert um, analytics in Drucker, and there was a visiting professor who was teaching us writing for leaders. So I loved both of them because that was summer courses, and I think it really developed my perspective. But besides that, I'm an org eval an HRM student. So I like Professor uh, Stephen Gilliland and Cindy Gilliland. This is a couple and they take psychology, like, you know, consulting, change management, like those, uh, you know, soft uh, subjects, I would say. But the four sure. credit organization behavior one, like Professor Stephen is the best. And awesome. he really makes us like, you know, his way of teaching is outstanding. That's great. Thank you all for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for asking. That was a great question. It makes me excited to see all of our students, you know, so happy with our faculty. Yeah. It's a it's a really great school. Um I mean, obviously I I just went to the the Drucker school, but you know, I got accepted into USC and Loyola. Uh, you know, I got accepted into some other business schools around. And I chose the Drucker School because of their focus on leadership and people. And I loved the Claremont Colleges so much. Like I said, I, I went to Pitzer for my undergrad. And I it's just such a conducive environment and so supportive to learning. And everything's right there. You don't ever need to leave Claremont. Everything's Everything you need is right there. 
even an ice cream shop. So, you know, that's important. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, I was wondering, just now you mentioned that right out of school, well, before you even graduated, you were applying for companies that believe in the drug system, right? So, or the, the philosophy, how did you find those companies? So I, I did a lot of research on who were former Peter Drucker clients, like what big companies were Peter Drucker clients, which of those companies had rotation programs, if you're familiar with what that is. Um, and so, and then once I, once I did that, then I said, okay, which of those companies might I be interested in working for? What was their, their path to application and to get in? And did I know anyone um, or did any of my professors at Drucker know anyone? Um, and so I kind of tapped into the network that was there of people who knew to get informational interviews. And then I just like was dead set and focused on, okay, here's, here's this list of of companies that that I want to get a job for that have rotation programs that were all Peter Drucker clients. And, you know, I just, I just put together a solid, solid marketing plan and I went after it relentlessly. Thank you. That's very inspirational because I would say a lot of us are graduating in May and, you know, our our focus right now is what does that, you know, post-graduation career look like for us? Um, so some great ideas of like things to research and kind of where to start, because I think we could agree that we would all love to work for a company that, you know, has the same values that Peter Drucker, um, you know, taught and believed in. Deborah, did you want to maybe take it from here? Yes, thank you so much, Mira. Thank you. This is just wonderful to chat with you and just hear your story and gain some really valuable advice. I have lots of notes. So <laughs> I'm very appreciative of it. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And we'll definitely look up how to order that ice cream and get it shipped here so we can enjoy it. And we'll certainly take pictures and let you know. But thank you again, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, we did record this, so we will have the recording on our website probably next week or in a couple of weeks, just so for those people that weren't able to make it, they can be able to watch and participate in that way. But thank you again. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. And thank you, Tamara. We appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks, everyone. Make it a delicious one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.